Workers' Compensation is the oldest insurance program in the United States. With the rapid growth of industrial jobs in the early 20th century, workplace injuries became more common and dangers more apparent of working in factories, with heavy machinery or in hazardous conditions. A system was needed to deal with these injuries and to compensate the workers who suffered from them. Prior to the establishment of workplace compensation, an injured or disabled worker had to sue his or her employer for wages and future earnings as well as medical expenses. Workers usually lost these cases which damaged the employer-employee relationship and contributed to mistrust between employers and their workers. Employers are frequently used three defenses in lawsuits by employees. Assumption of risk. The injury was from a normal and accepted danger associated with the job. The fellow worker rule. The injury was caused by a fellow worker's negligence. And contributory negligence. The worker's negligence contributed to the accident. Workers had to wait a long time for any possible financial compensation. And if someone were injured, the inability to earn a living combined with accumulating lawyer's fees could be devastating. Now we know the history of workplace compensation and why we have it. But how does it work? Tonight we learn how this program works and what types of injuries it covers. Welcome back to First Issues. In our program tonight, we unpack the workers' compensation program and how it works for both the employer and the employee. To interrogate the subject further, we speak to Busi Lesetedi of the Botswana Insurance Company Limited. Basically, uh, workers' compensation is a provision by government uh, to protect employees in the event of uh, an occupational injury or an occupational disease. Now, how does this work? Firstly, every employer is expected or required to have workers' compensation insurance. It is a requirement by the Workers' Compensation Act of 1998. You need to have workers' compensation insurance. In this scenario, what makes for an employer? Does it refer to the traditional, contractual, formal employee-employer relation? Or does it refer to the more informal arrangements, someone who engages help in their home or even on their farm? Yes, it does include your helper at home, uh, your head boy at the kettle post. And a lot of people uh, don't seem amenable to this, but that covers them as well. Every employer, and according to the act, every employer means every person or every institution or corporate entity that pays uh, somebody to do work for them. So if you do that, you are an employer and you're expected to have workers' compensation insurance. What are the basic guidelines for claiming compensation as an employee? Well, obviously when you get injured at work, you are the one that knows that you've been injured. Your employer might not know. Uh, as much as it is their duty, uh, to ensure that you are compensated for every occupational injury or occupational disease. It is your duty to report such an injury um, to your employer. Your employer then is expected or required rather uh, to report the same to the Workers' Compensation Commissioner uh, at the Ministry of Labour. The employer is also required to notify the insurer uh, so that they know that there is a claim that they might have to settle. It's a long process uh, because after that injury, the employer issues an employee with a, an instruction to go and uh, be examined by a medical doctor. The medical doctor is also guided by uh, provisions in the Act uh, in terms of um, the level of incapacities, the percentages and everything else. It's all prescribed in black and white. Um, they don't think up a figure and give it to you. Um, for example, if, you, if an injury results in loss of sight, complete loss of sight, you're entitled to 100% compensation. And that compensation is actually tied to one's earnings. And it is calculated based on 12 months calculated backwards. Um, further on, uh, there is also for total uh, incapacity. Uh, 
60 times your monthly salary. But that payment cannot exceed 250,000. Basically what that means is that if you're not insured as an employer, you're going to pay that from your bottom line. It's as simple as that. Also, if you're not insured, you are in contravention of this act, which means you are liable or guilty of an offense and you'll be uh, liable to pay um, 5,000 pula uh, or three months imprisonment or both. Busila Seteri says every single employer should be insured, except for government. We had to ask then, how does it work for government? Well, for government, I can't say I'm really sure about it, but they are also uh, bound by the requirements of the Workers' Compensation Act in terms of compensation, but not insurance. So if an employee uh, is injured, they are entitled to compensation for the same. If you're called upon to compensate an employee and you're not able to do so, you are liable uh, and guilty to pay uh, to an amount not exceeding 10,000 pula or uh, six months imprisonment or both. Now that we have established that a lot more of us than one may have initially assumed can be classified as employers, where then do we go and how do we go about registering for workplace compensation insurance? Well, the process is pretty simple. You go to an insurer, uh, we have insurance intermediaries, uh, agencies and brokers that you can talk to and they will link up, they will link you up with, with underwriters uh, and you'll have your uh, workers' compensation insurance done. The basic requirements, um, usually, for them to underwrite the risk of, of your workers' compensation, they're going to look for uh, the number of employees, they're going to want to know the salaries that they earn, like that your, your, your top earner, your top earners, and you, you know everybody in, in that list, but mostly they usually just ask for the amount uh, of the highest paid employee and the amount for the lowest paid employee. Then they'll be able to give you um, indicative rates before they firm it up with a complete policy. Next, we ask our guest whether there's a particular time frame within which an employee must report an injury or an illness. There actually is. Um, but, you see, a claim can be paid even if it's notified after 12 months. Um, even though even after 12 months, uh, the commissioner might consider other reasons why, uh, if there's reasonable cause, why such a claim should be paid even after 12 months. But the standard time to report is usually 17 days. You should have reported. Busi helps us understand exactly how workplace compensation is calculated. There is a schedule in the, in the Act that guides you. You see, when you submit um, a notification of, uh, of injury to the Workers' Compensation Commissioner, there's a form that you complete as an employer. Uh, that gives you wh where you detail the salary details of your employee for the last 12 months. It is based on that um, monthly salaries that that, that that calculation is going to be based upon. Yeah, there's also the, the, the medical uh, side where uh, an employer is going to pay for the recuperation or rehabilitation of an employee following uh, an injury. And the employer is liable to pay for medical bills. What types of injuries can I claim for as an employer? Any kind of, of injury that incapacitates you. If, for example, uh, you're involved in a car accident and you lose this part of the finger, or like I said earlier, if you, you are, God forbid, blinded, uh, then you're entitled to compensation. The percentages are prescribed. There's a percentage for each of the different phalanges for each finger. There's a schedule for the index finger, the thumb, the middle finger, for the left hand, for the right hand. All of it is prescribed in the, in, in, in the act to tell you 5%, 2%, 7% and all of that. So it is that detailed.
you don't need to go scrounging around you just check the act it will guide you as a medical doctor awarding or, or recommending that percentage because even after that percentage it still goes to um, a medical board that is appointed by the minister uh, to oversee uh, such issues to say yes this is uh, in fact in order or no no it is not let's revise it and then a proper award is made and for the employer is there a waiting period how soon after an employer insures their employees can they start claiming from insurance it is immediate you insure your employees workers compensation in the event of an injury you submit a claim through the normal procedures that I've just talked about and it will just go through the approval process and if need uh, be, an employee is compensated. Vusi says an employee's workplace compensation benefit will not be affected by any other financial products an employee may have registered for. This is compensation uh, and I must uh, uh, stress that it is not payment because you cannot really put a price to um, somebody's health or death or uh, loss of a limb. You cannot replace it really. Even if uh, you, you use uh, artificial limbs, you cannot put a price on, 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 on a life or on a, on, on a body part. So you will be compensated uh, irrespective of whether you have other insurances for life or for, for group life assurance that employers usually get as well. Uh, as an employee benefit uh, add-on for, for their employees. In the event of an accident, how is the evaluating physician selected? Is it someone of the employee or the employer's choosing? Following an injury, uh, an employer will give you an instruction as an employee to go and see a doctor or a medical practitioner, uh, rather, uh, of their choice. They are responsible for paying your medicals up to not, not less than 75,000 pula. And that is separate from compensation. This is just for medicals. Up not less than 75,000 pula. Uh, so they choose a doctor who will attend or examine the employee. Following such examination and a recommendation of percentages in terms of uh, uh, compensation, an employee uh, if they're not happy with the assessment or the medical examination by the practitioner, they have the right to go for a second opinion, but they will be liable to pay for such medical expenses as shall be charged by that medical practitioner for the second opinion. Next, our guest informs us on what happens when the two physicians' reports do not correlate. There is usually a reconciliation. That is why we have the, 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 the medical board uh, like I said, that is chosen or appointed by the minister. Uh, it comprises three medical uh, uh, doctors. Uh, one of them is the chair, uh, a legal person, and a person knowledgeable of uh, labor and employment issues. So they look at um, this issue uh, and reconcile and then determine the, the actual award. Our guest says some employees suffer from a condition he has labeled compensitis. What does he mean by this? There's also instances where um, some employees might, might have an ailment that I'll call compensitis, where they forge um, documents to say they, they, they were uh, injured at work or they aggravate an injury. Um, in such an instance, uh, the employer will not be liable to pay if you aggravate uh, uh, an injury as an employee. As we conclude our conversation, our guest informs us that an incident becomes a matter for workplace compensation insurance if it occurs on the work premises. But there are, however, exceptions. If um, you are employed based in, in, in Khaboron, as an example, and you are on a trip to Francistown, driving to Francistown, even if you're driving yourself, uh, even when you have a driver, uh, but you're driving yourself, and you are involved in an accident. You, when you're driving to Francistown to work, you are actually working, you're on a trip, uh, so you are employed, it is in the normal uh, line of, of your employment, so you are eligible for compensation. 
Welcome back to First Issues. Anchored in the middle of the Chobe River between Namibia and Botswana stands an intriguing local construct that offers the increasing responsible traveler market the amazing opportunity to dine unobtrusively in that beautiful environment. On it, all doors have been used as bar counters, the remnants of the hull of an old ship made into signage, the cutouts from that sign made into another, old canvas into a roof. 90% of it is entirely reused material. And now fully operational, the restaurant maintains that no waste at all from their operations makes it into their surroundings. Good intentions have resulted into a noteworthy product. A desire not to waste materials from a ruined lodge resulted in the unique upcycling project that is the raft. And Cornelia Rotenbach is here to tell us all about it. Why was it important for you to keep this project eco-friendly and in which ways did you go about doing this? The main reason is its location, for starters. I mean, we're uh, not only are we uh, on the edge of the national park, but we're on a river that feeds the people, you know? There's fish, there's crocodiles, there's hippos, there's elephants, there's an enormous amount of bird life why wouldn't anybody want to keep it eco-friendly? That's why it's so important to us. I mean, this is, this is everybody in Kasani's livelihood. You know, it's all about the wildlife. We don't want to destroy it. We want to help it grow, help it to um, sustain itself. And I think that's why it's been so important for us. How did you make sure that um, both the construction and the day-to-day -day runnings uh, protect the environment that you're in? Well, for starters, everything pretty much on the raft has been recycled. It's probably about 90% recycled material that we've used to construct the raft. Um, we have a policy on here, anything that comes onto the raft has to go off. There's nothing that's deposited into the water. Even our uh, very basic toilets are porta potties that are then taken back to um, the lodge and disposed of in the lodge. Um, there's no running water, so even the dishes, you know, the dirty plates get taken back to the lodge to be washed. Um, and yeah, so there's nothing that goes, everything that goes onto the raft comes back off again. In an environment like this, that's probably the greenest you can go. We don't want to put anything in the water. I mean, there's, there's an enormous amount that you can spend on technology to recycle stuff that goes to process stuff, but it makes more sense taking it back to where it can naturally be um, disposed of. You've mentioned how the unique positioning of the raft allows somebody to enjoy from where they're sitting um, the sights of Sidudu and the wildlife, as well as the cultural offerings of cows and fishing uh, from Namibia. How has the uptake been? Well, we've had a lot of um, changes. Um, you know, the concepts changed a few times. Um, the designs changed, the tables have changed, the, even the kitchen um, area, the, the way that everything was going to be done was changed uh, several times. Um, but I think once we introduced the product to the people around and they actually realized that when you sit here, it's quiet. You can't hear anything. Every now and again, you've got a boat coming past, but you've got elephants. I mean, there were elephants crossing right in front of us on our very first official lunch here. We had elephants crossing right in front of the raft. It was magical. We, I couldn't believe my, my luck. You know, I, ever since then, you know, that first introduction, I think it's just spread wildfire by word of mouth. We haven't, we've done a bit of marketing uh, for it, but pretty much everything's been by word of mouth. Clearly this is an evolving project um, from what you're learning as you go along. But where to from now? Is there anything else you're going to be changing in the near future? You know, we've realized that there's a few logistical problems that we're having. You know, for example, keeping ice cold in October. So, so you know, there's, 
there's the likelihood of putting something in where we can keep our ice cold, um, possibly another level, a uh, serving counter level. But we still want to keep it as natural as possible. So, um, yeah, without evolving too much into a giant machine, we want to keep it simple yet effective. Ecotourism principles support educating the people you serve on the importance of keeping things eco-friendly. Um, is this something you've con considered when catering to your clients? It has been something that we've, uh, we're playing around with. I mean, for starters, just the story of how it was built um, would be kind of fun to display somewhere on the raft to show people how easy it is actually to be eco-friendly without spending much money. Mm. Um, and, um, and I think it's important to people. I mean, it certainly is an interest for those around. From what you've discerned, do the general public really care about this kind of issue, about eco-friendly ventures? Well, uh, certainly when I've been on the raft and people ask, how did you do this, you know? You say to them, okay, well, we've recycled this and we've recycled that and we've upcycled this and we've upcycled that. And they're like, oh, wow, that's really cool, you know? And I think in general, the world has come to expect people to be eco-friendly, especially in an, in an environment like this. Any last words as to the offerings that the raft gives um, to people? I'm sorry you weren't here for lunch to enjoy it with us, but yeah, the, the raft is an exceptional uh, and extraordinary activity in Kusani that, that Flame of Africa offers. And um, it's unique. It's across from the island. It's absolutely silent apart from the fishermen or uh, banana boats that come past. It's really a spectacular product. Cornelia and the Raft Project are just one example of the many individuals that are taking it upon themselves and gaining support from even government to further ecotourism projects. And we will be looking into these and other innovators and trendsetters in the coming weeks. Until then, from me, Nameto Sibina, the team behind First Issues, and our sponsors, First National Bank, we wish you a good night and pleasant viewing.